This lecture will be covering uh, part one of a three-part medical emergency series. We're going to be discussing uh, shock, different forms of shock, otherwise known as hypoperfusion. We'll be reviewing the latest BLS resuscitation uh, guidelines, and we'll start talking about some specific body system emergencies, uh, starting first with neurologic and then moving on to the genitourinary systems. So when we talk about shock, what we're, we want to review is the fact that shock itself is the inability for the body to perfuse blood and oxygen-rich blood to the tissues and to the cells that comprise these tissues. The goal is to deliver not only sugar and nutrients, but more importantly, oxygen. Oxygen, as you know, is used with sugar in the process known as the Krebs cycle to produce ATP. Without oxygen, the body can still produce that ATP energy, but it only burns sugar and it's only very ineffective as opposed to 32 molecules of ATP for aerobic metabolism. It's only two to four molecules of ATP for this non-oxygenating anaerobic metabolism. In addition, the waste that is normally excreted during aerobic metabolism is CO2, which is easily removed from the body through the respiratory center. With no oxygen delivery and anaerobic metabolism as the first failsafe to try and create some energy, the waste product that we're creating is lactic acid. And now we're talking about a metabolic acidosis that in the hypoperfusion setting can lead to further tissue organ death and then eventually organ system death, multiple system organ failure, and overall body death. So this is a fatal spiral that is downward progressing and we need to stop it and the best way to stop it is to recognize first that it exists and to allow and to do your treatments to allow the body to restore proper circulation. Now there are various causes of shock. Each one has its own signature signs and symptoms. But they all end with that decompensation phase, which is the drop in blood pressure. That is your late sign of shock. So we never look for that early. You're going to see compensation early. The body is attempting to maintain adequate pressure to allow for good tissue perfusion. And the way the body supplies that perfusion is through a circulatory system that has proper pressures, both a systolic or pulse pressure and the diastolic or resting pressure. In order to keep this closed container under constant pressure and allow for adequate perfusion, the network of arteries, capillaries, veins, venules, arterioles, they all work in unison with the sole purpose of red blood cell delivery to the capillaries in the tissue. Now there are two circuits in the body of the, of the circulatory system. The one I described about sending oxygenated blood down to the tissue. That's known as systemic circulation. We also have the pulmonary circulation, which is governed by the right side of the heart, which pumps deoxygenated blood, rich with carbon dioxide, back to the lungs for exhalation. The process of breathing is known as ventilation. The process of gas exchange at the tissue is known as respiration. The way that we actually do this gas exchange is through a passive natural process known as diffusion. And to recall what diffusion is, it's particles 
natural ability to move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. So if you're thinking about um, the pulmonary circulation at the alveoli, you've got the network of capillary beds that surround it. When you breathe in room air, 21% oxygen, it may be only 21% room air, but the concentration is much higher in the alveolar space than it is in the capillaries. So by that rationale and by the natural process of diffusion, that oxygen that's in the alveolar space will carry across into the capillary beds where, of course, they're picked up by red blood cells, four oxygen molecules seat on one hemoglobin protein, and off they go. So inversely, you've got the carbon dioxide higher concentration inside the vasculature as opposed to what's in the alveolar air. So we're going to diffuse that carbon dioxide naturally across. And so this is where the gas exchange takes place. Down to the tissue, it's the opposite. High oxygenated blood. Oxygen itself will begin to diffuse across into the tissue, going from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. All the oxygen that was in the tissue has been absorbed by the cells and has been metabolized through that Krebs cycle to create those 32 molecules of ATP. And the end result is the CO2 has been excreted by the cells and now it's sitting in the tissue and it's going from that area of high concentration in the tissue to the area of low concentration which is that oxygen rich capillary bed and they'll continue now to the venules, up to the veins, to the great vessels, and the whole process starts over again. So this is the whole natural order that keeps the cells with a constant supply of oxygen. When you have an issue where the pressures are not able to be sustained, you can't get that delivery to occur. And what ends up happening is the oxygen is not getting dumped off. It's not making it down into the capillaries. Also, we have a drop in CO2 because there's less aerobic metabolism. So we build up lactic acid and we become metabolically acidotic. This is us, this like I said, is that cycle that will downward spiral until the body dies. In order for this continual pressure to exist, the circulatory system must have all three of its structures functioning. It has to have a good pump, has to have a good set of pipes, and it has to have enough of the fluid, the contents. And lack of one of these processes or supply of substances will lead to what we call the pathophysiology of shock, the perfusion triangle. You can break it down. So let's look at the perfusion triangle. First, we'll talk about blood vessels, container functionality. If the blood vessels are not being able to be regulated correctly and they dilate, and you find this with disease states like anaphylaxis, like sepsis, like neurogenic shock. The vessels open up, we end up with more flow, but we have less pressure. Pusoyle's law, once again, says that when you have a, a container that's narrower, you increase your pressure. So with a wide vessel, that's unregulated, you'll have a drop in blood pressure. Looking at the blood in the perfusion triangle, the content function of the circulatory system, if there's um, enough blood loss, then you end up with a drop in blood pressure because whatever is remaining is 
unable to be pumped throughout the entire body. So when we talk about blood loss, we're talking about a term called absolute shock or absolute hypovolemia. That's hemorrhagic in nature. Blood loss through a breach of the circulatory system, whether it be through trauma, medical disease, whatever. You're losing blood because you have a breach of the system. That's known as absolute hypovolemia or low volume. When you're talking about blood vessel mis dysfunction, like you find with anaphylaxis or sepsis, this is known as relative hypovolemia. And our treatment as medics is going to be a little different to correct that hypoperfusion state, that type of hypovolemia. So we'll talk about that later. Now, the final part of the, of the perfusion triangle is the heart. You've got to have a good pump. Damage to the pump will not allow the pressures to be sustained. And of course, we see the primary issue with, with um, pump disorder is cardiogenic shock, but this is also can be caused by types of obstructive shock. By definition, blood is referred to as loose connective tissue. Tissue is a substance that is formed by groups of cells close together. Now, you can have dense connective tissue, like you have in bone, but this is loose because there's more fluid between the cells, but the cells are still together. And these cells that we're talking about, the formed elements, red blood cells, white blood cells, what else, what other formed elements do we have? Um, we have our proteins, we have our platelets. It was all together with the red and white blood cells and the plasma in between them that make the loose connective tissue. order for the system to work, it's got to be under constant pressures. The systolic pressure is the peak arterial pressure caused by the contraction of the left ventricle and pumping out of blood. Diastolic pressure is the resting pressure. In order to get blood down into the capillary beds, you need to have this pressure regulated. The way the body can regulate your blood pressure without your knowledge is through the autonomic nervous system. You're too busy with your daily activities to worry about what your constant blood pressure is and how to adjust it to meet your hemodynamic needs. So you rely on your involuntary or autonomic nervous system. And the autonomic nervous system is broken down, of course, as you know, into the sympathetic or parasympathetic, the fight or flight, or the feed or breed. And through these two very simple processes, the body can regulate blood pressure to accommodate internal issues and external forces. One way to increase pressure and to preserve blood that's, that's uh, remaining in the series of, in the evidence of absolute hypovolemia, hemorrhagic shock, we have capillary sphincters. Capillary sphincters can close right at the arterioles at where the end, going into the capillaries. They can constrict, they're comprised of smooth muscle. And when do you see capillary sphincters working in outside of the absolute hypovolemic state when we're trying to shunt blood? We see it naturally in, um, when we're extremely cold, you know, because we, want to, we don't want to perfuse the skin because it's so cold at the skin surface that that's gonna cool the blood down and bring it back to the core, which is gonna lower core temperature. 
So they can do that naturally in the presence of, of uh, an environmental issue. So the cardiovascular system maintains its constant pressures and regulates temperature. It deals with delivery of oxygen, but it relies on the respiratory system to provide that oxygen source for delivery. It relies on the gastrointestinal system to absorb nutrients like glucose that can be distributed throughout the body. It relies on the renal system to filter out the waste products to maintain proper pH. So the autonomic nervous system and the hormones epinephrine and norepinephrine and acetylcholine, these neurotransmitters are vital for constant regulation, homeostasis, hemostasis, and it's all controlled by the brain, the diencephalon, the, mid, the midbrain, the diagnostic centers. The autonomic nervous system is our fight or flight. It's a temporary stress response system. The parasympathetic nervous system is the feed or breed. It's the default setting. It's the relaxation, laying on the couch, eating potato chips, watching TV, just relaxing and taking it easy. It's regulated by the parasympathetic nervous system. normal functioning body can exist in a more parasympathetic state all the time with a sympathetic stress response regulated by epinephrine and norepinephrine. Shock can cause this stress response to occur. It is a real stress to the circulatory system because without your circulatory system there's no oxygen delivery. So when the circulatory system is compromised in any way it creates a systemic stress response. All different causes of shock as you know but they all share one common issue and that is hypoperfusion and, and deoxygenation of tissue. Early stages of shock can be handled by the body through this sympathetic tone. That's compensation. Decompensation is when the body can no longer maintain the pressure necessary to perfuse. And now we start to decompensate. The blood pressure begins to fall. Irreversible shock is a point when body systems are beginning to fail. More than two body system failure is known as multi-system organ failure or multiple dis organ dysfunction syndrome. But this is not where we need to be. You can't replace body systems and a lot of them can't turn back on once they've shut down and destroyed. And that's why we call it irreversible shock. So compensated shock is the body flipping into sympathetic tone. It realizes there's a problem with the circulatory system, whether it's the, the hypovolemia is either absolute, like the hemorrhagic, or relative, like the vessels. And what you end up with is sympathetic response, norepinephrine, epinephrine secretion. And we know what these, drug, what these hormones do. They're alpha and beta agonists. So what we have is the alpha stimulation, alpha receptors found on smooth muscle of the arterioles. When activated, it causes the arterioles to contract. And the arterioles constrict, and we increase systemic vascular resistance, and our diastolic pressure will go up. The beta qualities of epinephrine and norepinephrine stimulate 
cardiac cells, increase inotropy, chronotropy, excitability, so we get tachycardic, and as a result, our systolic pressure rises. The beta-2 on the lungs causes bronchodilation, which increases our ability to breathe. Our, our respirations increase because our oxygen demand is going to be higher. But the brain is very sensitive. All this is, is happening so the brain can stay alive. The brain is aware that there's a problem that it probably can't fix on its own. So there is that restlessness, anxiety. Sometimes these patients have a sense of impending doom because of that helpless feeling. The body's aware of what's going on. It's very hard to get out, but your patients will give you clinical clues as to what stage shock they're in. So in addition to vital signs and, and BLS management and ALS interventions, talk to your patient. They will tell you. What ends up happening is the capillaries constrict, systemic vascular resistance is improved, and we increase and diastolic pressure rises. Systolic pressure also rises with the beta response through the cardiac cells. What the body also does is it decides it's time to conserve whatever blood is left. It wants to keep the brain, heart, and lungs perfused at the expense of all the other organs. And we call shock management the golden hour because most organs in the body can withstand oxygen deprivation and stay in anaerobic metabolism for 45 to 60 minutes before they begin to fail. The musculoskeletal system in the skin can be two to three hours. So the first organ and organ system to get blood shunted from it, we're on the clock here, is the skin, the musculoskeletal system. So what we end up with, cramping and cold, pale, sweaty skin, diaphoresis. Why? Well, there's no blood in the skin, so it loses color and warmth. So that's your initial sign that the patient is in compensatory shock. The blood pressure is going to be normal. The heart rate might be elevated. The blood pressure is going to be within normal limits. We're still losing blood. The next system to get shut down is the GI system, the hepatic portal system. That stores about 30% of your circulating blood volume. It's responsible for withdrawing the nutrients from the, the small intestine, sending them up to the liver for processing, and then dumping the nutrient-rich blood into the hepatic veins for distribution to the body. Okay, sounds fair. But if we shunt this blood away to preserve what's left, to keep the brain perfusing, the patients are going to be they're going to start complaining of GI issues, nausea, vomiting sometimes. This is how you know that we've entered stage two. We're at about 15% blood loss now. Blood pressure is going to be within normal limits. Pulse is going to be tachycardic patient is still compensating. We're still losing blood. We're still hypoperfusing to the brain. So the next system to get shunted are the kidneys. The kidneys are responsible for filtering out all of our waste. These cells and tissue that are undergoing anaerobic metabolism for the last half hour have created a lot of lactic acid. The body is now metabolically acidotic. It can't afford to have the blood shunted from the kidneys. 
but the brain realizes there's no other choice. It's got to stay alive. So what's our patient going to start complaining of? When the kidneys lose blood flow, they trigger a thirst response. This is a sign of dehydration. That's why most doctors say, you know, you can do the eight glass of water a day, but really what's better for homeostasis is drink when you're thirsty. Because your kidneys can sense when there's a sudden drop in pressure due to dehydration. So the kidneys are looking at what's going on as you're dehydrated. So the thirst response kicks in. If you have a patient who's complaining of thirst, it means that the kidneys are in the process of having blood shunted in away from them and will shut down very quickly. That is the bridge that takes you from compensated shock to decompensated shock. Because once you lose the ability to have renal function, your body can't get rid of that lactic acid and everything starts to get tired. The stress response is too much. The, the kidneys are shutting down so the epinephrine that's being secreted by the adrenal gland starts to drop off. We can't sustain our ability to compensate. We begin to lose that blood pressure and now all the lactic acid that, that was being put into the capillaries as the sphincters relax, it flushes out into the bloodstream and we end up in irreversible shock. So, patients will compensate for a long time, but listen to their complaints and it will tell you what stage of shock they're in. Decompensated shock is a marked drop in blood pressure less than 90 millimeters of mercury. At that point, now all this blood that's deoxygenated, crappy, lactic acid is just going to flow into the skin and you're going to get that cyanotic look. All that uh, acidic blood is going to go up to the brain, the patient's going to go unconscious. This is when the tissues begin to die because they're acidotic. The acid's eating away at the cells and killing whatever healthy living cells remain. You kill enough cells, you have tissue necrosis. You have enough tissue necrosis, you have organ failure. You have enough organs failing in a body system, you have that body system failure. You have two or more body systems fail, multiple system organ failure, and death. So this process has to be recognized and, and corrected, or at least sent on its way for complete correction, like making a decision on not only when to transport, but where to transport. And this is why we always talk about the golden hour. The golden hour relates to tissue life and organ, the organ's ability to stay on anaerobic metabolism. That's why we give it an hour. We don't have an hour. They need to be on an operating room table, we need to have blood restored. They need sometimes, in a case of pump failure, to have emergency care like a balloon pump inserted to give the, the left ventricle assistance. All these things have to be done at a hospital, so we have to make these decisions quickly. That's why they told what we do, the platinum 10 minutes. So remember, these are the different causes of shock. We have our pump failure, which is cardiogenic or that obstructive shock like a tension pneumothorax, cardiac tamponade. Low fluid volume, we talk about the hypovolemic shock, relative hypovolemic shock, or hemorrhagic shock. We also have our non-hemorrhagic shock, issues where um, we're not hemorrhaging out, but we're losing blood, um, we're dehydrated. Then we have our poor vessel function, distributive types of shock, sepsis, uh, neurogenic shock, anaphylactic, and psychogenic. So let's talk about each one. So cardiogenic is pump failure. When the pump fails, the systolic pressure drops, it's hard to maintain um, systemic vascular resistance, and blood begins to back up. 
your ejection fraction lowers. You're not pumping out as much as you used to, so there's more blood remaining in the left ventricle. That causes the left atria to stay full, and now there's blood waiting to drain into the left atria from the pulmonary vein. It's starting to swell. We're building up hydrostatic pressure, and the closest exit ramp in the circulatory system to this are the capillaries that line the alveoli. Remember, capillary is the only part of the circulatory system that is semi-permeable, that can allow products in and out. So at this point, all this, this uh, hydrostatic pressure, this buildup of fluid pressure inside is relieved when plasma crosses over into the lungs and we've got rails. This pulmonary edema, of course, is going to get in the way of the normal gas exchanges. So now hypoxia is going to occur with blood pressure drop. So there's an oxygen being delivered to the vessels, the capillary beds around the alveoli, but the pump's not working, so it's not getting down to the tissue, even if it made it across, what little does make it across. And this is a rapid type of shock where body systems can shut down pretty quickly. Cardiogenic shock is going to occur when, when the pump no longer is able to get blood down to the tissue. In a situation like this, the only cure is a new heart or an assistance like a balloon pump or a left ventricular assist device. So signs and symptoms of cardiogenic shock, we have the cyanosis, the cool extremities, change in mental status. Just all that compensatory function. But Unlike other types of shock, the beta receptors on a diseased heart won't be as effective. So you may not see that tachycardia. Our emergency care after scene safety, of course, is we do our primary assessment with airway management. We may have to take over the airway. Uh, we need, may have to be more aggressive with our airway management to treat the pulmonary edema, positive pressure ventilation. If the patient is awake and able to assist, oxygen and putting them in a position of comfort. And of course, don't give them nitro if the blood pressure is less than 100 because that defeats the purpose of the, what's happening with the shock. You're, you're, not, you're going to be lowering the blood pressure and going against what the body's trying to do to restore perfusion. Keep alert for the fact that the pump is going to fail at any time. And when the pump goes into complete failure, it's cardiac arrest. Now, talk about obstructive shock. Obstructive shock occurs when we have different types of issues that can cause a mechanical dysfunction of our blood vessels. So, cardiac tamponade is a squeezing down of the heart. It can be caused by primarily trauma, but also disease processes like a um, an effusion, an infection that causes it, uh, pericarditis can lead to swelling and, and pericardial tamponade. So either way, you've got the, a restriction of the pump, and as a result, we're going to have a drop in systolic pressure. Attention pneumothorax is a buildup of air in the thoracic cavity, pushing our structures across from the affected side to the unaffected side, going across the mediastinum, and this process is actually causing restriction of blood flow and pumping action. So what's our emergency care for these things? Well, cardiogenic shock, I'm sorry, um, pericardial tamponade, there's an in-hospital procedure called pericardial synthesis. Unless you're a critical care paramedic, this is something that's only done in the hospital, where a needle is inserted under the xiphoid process, and it, it's about an 8 to 10 inch needle that pierces the pericardial sac, and you can withdraw the fluid out, and then you have a, almost an instantaneous restoration of blood pressure and, and a change in mental status, reverts back to normal. Pneumothorax, of course, we have, if they show the signs, needle decompression. And remember to review your 
local regional guidelines for needle decompression because there's a difference between simple pneumo and attention pneumo. Okay, attention pneumo is going to have clinical signs and symptoms like chest pain and subcutaneous emphysema and our tracheal shifting can be felt. So these are things you want to look for and make the decision based on the regional protocols, what your standing orders are. Now distributive shock, we're talking about widespread dilation through um, disease process, um, through burns, things like that. So what happens with the blood vessels when they become dilated, we end up lowering our pressure. So septic shock is brought on by septicemia, and septicemia is a blood infection. It's a systemic infection where the body is trying to combat this systemically. And normally with infections, the way that the body deals with it is it causes, it causes dilation of the vessel at the source of infection. It allows for white blood cells to enter, to phagocytose and destroy the uh, pathogen and any tissue or cells that have been affected by the pathogen and then we regrow and everything's fine. But if this is um, suddenly uh, an expansive systemic type of infection, then the, this, the way the body treats it is exactly the same as a localized, which would be the dilation. But now this is a systemic dilation. So this is a problem. And we have issues like cytotoxic storms that occur where we just overwhelm the body system with white blood cells and they start destroying healthy tissue as well as disease tissue. So it's a the major problem. But from a cardiovascular standpoint, the dilation occurs as part of the um, immuno response. So our emergency care for septic shock is to really focus on the airway, breathing. These people are going to need a higher oxygen demand. Um, we want to make sure we have an IV in place, and there are times when we can actually, this is a form of relative hypovolemia, so we can give fluids as opposed to a hemorrhagic type of shock where fluids are really more managed. A neurogenic shock, the body no longer has the ability to regulate the body system through the autonomic nervous system, and as a result, the body defaults to parasympathetic. Um, this can be caused by things like brain tumors and uh, spinal cord trauma, and then or, um, congenital issues like spina bifida. So when the blood vessels don't receive a stress response from the body, they default back to our setting of parasympathetic tone, and that's dilation. And in neurogenic shock, if you have blood loss, you're going you're gonna to decompensate a lot quicker. There won't be any compensation because there's no control of the autonomic nervous system. That link has been severed between the brain and the body. So for these patients with distributive types of shock, for neurogenic, of a neurogenic nature, you want to, of course, take C-spine precautions, give oxygen, you may have to intubate these patients and take over their breathing because depending on where they have the spinal cord injury, they can lose their phrenic nerve ability to move the diaphragm. Now I talked about septic shock being an um, an immuno response. This is that's of the cell mediated immune system. Anaphylaxis is a humoral immune system over exaggeration to a foreign invader known as an antigen. People are genetically predisposed to anaphylaxis, whereas anybody can become septic. People who are predisposed. Um, to sept to anaphylaxis react in a hyper exaggerated and sometimes improper manner. Something as simple as a bee sting or smelling peanut oil can trigger a release of histamine from every mast cell 
in the body, and mast cells are found all over the, the linings of tissue that has an opening to the outside environment, like the skin, the, the um, cardiovascular system, and the respiratory system. And with anaphylactic shock, it's the respiratory component that we're concerned about because this, this histamine release along the trachea and bronchus and bronchioles will cause severe swelling and actually pinch off the, re the respiratory system and there'd be no oxygen delivery and death is quick behind. So anaphylactic patients don't have that same compensatory phase because their respiratory center is, is actually under attack. They'll die of respiratory arrest before uh, that end stage multi-system organ failure with kidney dysfunction and things like that. So we, our treatment for anaphylaxis has got to be focused on the respiratory center. Okay, and these are our common causes, injections, ingestions, I, mean, I don't have to tell you. This is, we, we've seen it, we know what to look for, but we focus on the respiratory system because um, it won't give the, t the body time to compensate, it's just going to become hypoxic. How do you know your patient is anaphylactic? Well, they have signs of allergic reaction, which is the flushing and the urticaria, the edema uh, that's caused by that histamine release by every mast cell in the body. Um, they're going to have that um, sudden drop in blood pressure, and they'll try and compensate, but it's, there's so much excess fluid that's stretching out. All that, all that swelling, all that histamine is now in the bloodstream, and it's causing the vessels to swell. And, of course, they're going to have the wheezing and tightening of the throat. So that's our, going to be our focus, is airway management. You know, and in addition to rapid airway control, epinephrine will assist because it will do two things. It's obviously going to have the beta-2 adrenergic effects and open up the bronchioles, but it's also going to... Um, cause increase in systemic vascular resistance and increase the heart rate. So that's going to address the blood pressure. But understand that epinephrine alone is not going to cure anaphylaxis. The swelling is being caused by the histamine release and the tracheal obstruction, epinephrine is not going to really have as big a role. It's more about bronchial dilation. If that trachea swells up shut, it doesn't matter if down in the lower areas are open. You're not going to get any air moving through that passageway. So you have to create an artificial passageway, and that involves intubation. Final type of distributive shock we have is psychogenic. And it, what it does is um, it creates this sudden, almost vagal response. Inversely, instead of having um, a sympathetic thing, sometimes a stress reaction will trigger a parasympathetic or vagal nerve stimulation and that will cause a sudden drop in blood pressure and heart rate and the, and the patient will collapse. Okay, this is, this is something that usually rectifies itself on its own, the body recognizes there's a problem. But also understand that psychogenic shock, this type of syncopal episode, can be brought up by other issues in addition to stimulation of the vagus nerve and parasympathetic tone, we could also have dysrhythmias that can be affected. We can also have a brain aneurysm causing this. So there's different things that are categorized under distributive shock, now under as psychogenic shock. So our, our care is specific to the issue at hand. Okay. Um, Never take it for granted that it's just somebody who passed out. Any syncopal episode needs a cardiorespiratory workup, especially on an elderly patient. It could have been uh, as simple as standing up suddenly and having a sudden change in environmental pressures causing you to collapse, pass out because you can't compensate fast enough because you're older, to something more serious like a run of VTAC or a rapid atrial fib causing a sudden drop in blood pressure.
Now, hypovolemic shock, there are two types. Like I said, you have your relative and your absolute. Either way, it's an inadequate amount of fluid that's in the system. And because there's an adequate amount of fluid, we've got a drop in pressure and, and a hypoperfused state. So hemorrhagic is absolute. Non-hemorrhagic is relative. In addition to non-hemorrhagic stuff like burns, we also have that dehydration. So based on what's going on with your patient, with the volume, you got to be able to manage the ABCs, listen to your patient, give oxygen. They're going to need more oxygen. They're going to need to um, be in a hyper oxygenated state. It helps with keeping the brain function going. And your fluid resuscitation should be based on the type of hypovolemic shock you're dealing with. Now, in 2002, the American College of Emergency Physicians published their guidelines for fluid resuscitation in the emergency care setting. And they made a distinction not only between relative and absolute hypovolemia, but what type of trauma we have, blunt force versus penetrating, abdominal versus non-abdominal. And what they said was fluid resuscitation is appropriate, but it needs to be moderated. So we don't give three liters of fluid and look for a response. Three liters of fluid to a hemorrhagic patient in absolute hypovolemia can cause reduction of clotting factors, it can cause re-bleeding, it can cause um, a buildup of lactic acid being released into, into the bloodstream and metabolic acidosis. It has been shown to in, increase morbidity and mortality. And, and we're looking at overall outcomes. So we need to restrict it and give it based on hemodynamic monitoring. You don't want the systolic blood pressure to drop below 88 millimeters of mercury systolic. You want to maintain a blood pressure that is adequate but doesn't drop below. That's, that's decompensating. 88 millimeters of mercury and above will perfuse the kidneys. That is our goal. So we're going to ask the patient, how are you feeling? A thirst response is a very, it, it, it's a very overwhelming response because the body considers that to be serious. So the patient will tell you whether or not they're thirsty. It sometimes can even be a distracting type of complaint. So thirst is very important. Start the IVs, absolutely. On the way to the hospital, don't waste time cutting into the platinum 10 minutes to start your IVs. Your IV is in the back of the ambulance on the way to the hospital. Talk to your patient. Are they complaining of thirst? You know, if they are, increase the, eye, the fluid until they stop complaining of thirst and their blood pressure is restored above 88 systolic. This is what we want to do. Be very careful. Just don't store two large bore IVs and pump three liters of fluid. It's going to sometimes cause more harm than good. Now, when we're talking about respiratory insufficiency, patients with severe chest injuries are going to have, in, in some instances, an, in, an inadequacy of ventilation. They're going to have a mismatch of ventilation and perfusion, what they're able to get into their alveoli versus what can make it into the bloodstream. This is called a VQ mismatch. And that can bring on shock because even with a good, well-functioning cardiovascular system, it's not delivering any any oxygen because it wasn't getting any from its only source, which is the respiratory system. Other things can bring it on inside trauma. We can have chemicals and other particles that get in the way of the ability for the body to use oxygen, like carbon monoxide poisoning and cyanide poisoning. 
In addition, we can have um, congenital issues like anemia, the inability to have enough red blood cells to make tissue perfusion appropriate for all the cells. So when you have these patients, you got to identify based on what is wrong with them. Is it trauma? Is it carbon monoxide poisoning? Is cyanide toxicity? These are things you have to look at and treat based on what you find. But airway is big. These patients sometimes require airway management. In cases like carbon monoxide poisoning, there may be other issues going on like burns, respiratory burns, all different things. So you need to take in your entire um, patient, how they present to you, and, and formulate a treatment regimen based on those findings. So what's our general emergency care for shock? Well, it's our universal algorithm for how we approach all patients. You, you do your assessment and you get your evidence, all of your diagnostics, the same way, regardless of what's wrong with the patient. So it all starts, of course, with seeing safety and doing your ABCs. You want to limit your time when you find someone in shock to that 10 minutes or less. You, that golden hour, that time that, that organs can stay alive, that 45 to 60 minutes, that's what we're worried about. We have to be at the hospital before then. See some fine precautions, of course, when necessary, when you suspect anything. Control any obvious external bleeding. In the instance of hemorrhagic shock, it's much better to maintain blood volume than to replace blood volume with salt water. The body can clot better when it's warm. Cold bodies do not clot. So by, leave, by maintaining body heat, you will allow clotting to occur and work better. And we do vital signs every five minutes for unstable patients and every 15 for stable. Now with children, children compensate much longer than, than adults. They don't have those clinical signs. The, the classic um, adrenergic response with the cool pale diaphoretic skin and the shunting and the kidneys and all that. They don't do that. Sometimes they have very mild, almost undetectable signs. One of the, the two big signs you got to look for is a change in mental status and cap refill. Change in mental status is not irritable, it's stoic. You know, and we sometimes make that mistake if we show up to um, a scene where there are multiple patients and we're doing our initial triage. We tend to gravitate towards the person who is yelling. The person is on the phone, screaming, calling their parents, or they're on the phone with the insurance company or yelling at the police or the other driver. And we just want that noise to stop. So we are drawn to them. And usually, the people who are screaming the loudest are the less injured. So we'll walk by a car and we'll see two kids sitting in the back seat and they're quiet and stoic and staring straight ahead. And to an untrained eye, we'd say, okay, they're all right, but they're actually potentially not okay. That is a change in mental status. That's a stoic nature. A pediatric brain looks at life a little different than an adult brain. It's not completely formed yet. So when it's under attack and there's hypoperfusion, it's not quite sure what to do. So the kid's just staring straight ahead into space, not really able to answer your questions. It's scared. Other things we have, we lose the ability to perfuse down to the tissue. And the way we see that in children is capillary refill. Always, always, always do capillary refill. Because even in early stages of shock, they'll start to have delayed capillary refill. But if you don't catch the, the mild signs, you don't check for things like cap refill, these are the kids that suddenly just decompensate and they um, quote unquote dropped off the table. And you can't figure out why, you can't understand. Focus on mental status and cap refill for pediatric shock patients. Now the elderly patients, much different. 
course, they don't have that classic sign. But unlike children are not fully developed yet, elderly patients are beyond fully developed, but their systems are starting to break down. And in addition, they take a slew of medications, and a lot of them take it for cardiac respiratory um, problems, chronic problems. And now these drugs can get in the way of compensation, so their compensatory changes might be more mild. So once again, hard to see. That's why New York State says, for a trauma patient, anybody over the age of 55 involved in a trauma is considered a serious patient that should go to a trauma center, just by age alone for this reason. In addition to their compensatory uh, capabilities, you know, they have structural issues, arthritis, dentures get in the way and cause an airway obstruction. Um, the renal function is going to decrease to begin with, so they, they, can't, they can't withstand a metabolic acidotic state like a younger person could. So for these patients, uh, we want to up-treat them. We want to up-triage and we up-treat them. Because of the neuropathies and the inability to process pain, we want to think about um, focusing on state, um, spinal mobilization on mechanism of injury when you have a patient who's not complaining of any neck or back pain. Because it can still exist, but they don't know it. They're not getting the signal. So you really got to focus and look at the mechanism. We always maintain our ABCs, we give oxygen, we control the external bleeding, and we transport. So shock management for the ALS patient is specific to what type of hypoperfused state we're in. If we're in a hypovolemic state, is it relative or is it absolute? If it's relative, like burns or dehydration, then we think about fluid resuscitation. If it's hemorrhagic in nature, we're more concerned about controlling external bleeding and keeping the blood pressure enough for renal perfusion than we are about pumping in large volumes of fluid. And of course, through everything else, airway management is key because we don't want our patient going into cardiac arrest. But if we find ourselves with a patient in cardiac arrest, we have to follow a very general guideline. Now, BLS resuscitation, this has been going on for over 50 years. Okay? And every five or six years, um, the American Heart Association, American Red Cross, and other agencies, they meet and they decide on what is the right way to give CPR to do this resuscitation, what is the new standard of care? And it's based a lot on research. So understanding cardiac arrest, what causes the heart to suddenly stop working? Well, in children, the number one cause of cardiac arrest is respiratory arrest. But adults can have respiratory failure as well. That can lead to cardiac arrest. Trauma, untreated hypoperfusion, Okay, and what we're doing when we're doing CPR, as you know, is that we're doing a manual override of a normal autonomic function. The manual override is not effective enough. It's not as good as the autonomic. But what we're trying to do is keep the brain, heart, and lungs perfused. Those are the three organs that we're focusing on. We're kind of taking over from the brain's mission statement. We're not as concerned about the other tissue as we are about the brain. We don't really care about the liver or the kidneys right now. It's all about keeping the brain cells perfused with enough oxygen, not for conscious thought to come back, but for instead just oxygenation so they don't die. It buys time. The priority is always immediate and definitive treatment. And when we talk about this, as paramedics, you should be, if not certified as an instructor, 
be able to do CPR at an instructor level. And by saying that, I mean you should be able to direct chest compressions and be able to assure that appropriate compressions are being done because you have to take a team approach. You're the person making decisions with advanced care. In addition, you have to review advanced directives, you have to talk to the medical control, so you need to stand back. You're not working at the chest, but you need to be able to make sure that the work being done there is being done effectively. So basic life support, it's that non-invasive chest compressions, emergency life saving. It, in, it can do things like clear an obstructed airway. It can allow the patient to breathe artificially and can have the heart pump strong enough to get blood to the brain. The new guidelines were really focused more on compressions. And let me tell you why. Because I know sometimes, as paramedics, we're very resistant to change. Well, let's just hold off a second and realize why we start with chest compressions first. In Europe, they call CPR CCP. And it stands for cerebrocoronary perfusion. And why they call it that is, whenever you do compressions, you are not only mimicking the pumping action of the heart, but you're changing the thoracic pressures like a bellows, and you are allowing, with an open airway, air to be exchanged, inhalation and exhalation. The downward thrust can cause systolic pressure, but it also changes the thoracic pressure in the chest, tightens it up, and forces air out exhalation. When you release and allow the chest to recoil back, you are allowing diastolic pressure to occur. You're increasing your, your resting pressure and that's causing a return of blood back to the heart and that of course perfuses coronary arteries. But also when the airway is open to the environment, you are changing the pressure gradient inside the chest and air is rushing in. So that process is not only doing perfusion to the brain, but gas exchange as well. This is why community CPR is focused on compression only. You don't need to do positive pressure in the beginning. You don't need to do the mouth-to-mouth -mouth in the beginning. You focus on circulation. Physiologically, you're making changes in the thorax, and that could be enough. At first, of course, for maximum opportunity for overall outcomes, you need to have advanced life support maneuvers, which in addition to IVs, IOs, and medication administration, um, and, and our hypothermia protocols, we also want to be aggressive with airway management, positive pressure ventilation, which will increase our oxygen contents and allow for whatever blood's being perfused to be as oxygen rich as possible. But it all starts with compressions. That's why we focus on CAB in cardiac arrest. So our sequence is now establish unresponsiveness. Don't spend more than 10 seconds determining whether or not you need to do CPR. Look for signs of life. Check for that pulse. Don't do it more than 10 seconds. If you can't feel pulse after 10 seconds, the patient's not moving, they're in cardiac arrest. Give you 30 chest compressions at a rate of at least 100 a minute. We've eliminated the look, listen, and feel for breathing. It delays. Delays the compressions. We've got to maintain a good um, closed container system and every time we're doing compressions we do that but once we let we stop doing compressions the overall resting pressures drop and then we have to spend time restoring them 
That's why we maintain 30 compressions. We've de-emphasized that pulse check. If it's not early, clearly recognizable, err on the side of caution and do chest compressions. Chest compressions remain at least 100 times a minute for everybody, infant, children, and adult. At least two inches for adult, and then for children and infants, it's one third of the chest depth. So remember, for adults, it's two inch compressions. For children and infants, it's one third of their chest depth. ADUs, get them on as soon as possible. That hasn't changed, but the way that we can, the, the demographics have changed. So infants can use, you can use an adult AD on an infant as a last resort. If you don't have the, the uh, attenuator pads, those pediatric pads, you can use an adult pad on an infant. But remember, it would be a sternum and um, back type of setup because of the size of the pads. So adults use the standard AED. Children, of course, always go for the AED with the, with the dose attenuation pads that send a filtered shock down. In New York State, that's mandatory as part of your Part 800 to have adult and pediatric um, capabilities on your AED. And uh, I would always say as paramedics, I would push to have AEDs on your ALS trucks the simple fact that it's a good fail-safe in case your manual defibrillator, your monitor, fails. You have a fail-safe measure on your truck that can deliver a shock when needed. The manual defibrillator for infants is, the, is really the defibrillator of choice. When you don't have it, you can use pediatric or if there's no ALS personnel, you can use the pediatric, and if you don't have the pediatric, you can use the adult. Newborn resuscitation, we're thinking about CPR with an emphasis on ventilation. Because with newborns, it's all about them, it's all about triggering a, that first breath. Once they trigger that first breath, everything changes. Thoracic pressures change in the chest, the, um, the way that the body perfuses, changes, and the heart takes over. So getting this child breathing on their own is really the goal of neonatal resuscitation. So we get the AD on as soon as possible. We can stop doing chest compressions in order to put the pads on and turn it on and let it analyze and shock. But once we finish shocking, we immediately do two minutes CPR. Why would we do that? What if we got a pulse back? Well, the reason why is because even if we get a pulse back, we still have to prime the pump. There have been, uh, there's been a cessation of circulation and now suddenly the heart's beating again. It's now got to do a lot of work to get a restoration of pressure going. Plus, there may be blood clots in the heart. There's a whole different mess of things that you have to clear out. So just like your engine on a cold day, when you prime it a little bit before you turn the ignition over, you want to prime the pump. So you start doing chest compressions, and that restores circulation, allows the pump to start working again. And by doing chest compressions, when you do the release, you're allowing blood to return back to the heart and you're perfusing the coronary arteries. And by doing that, hopefully you're oxygenating the heart to let it work fast better and not, when it's turned back on again, be ischemic because it's denied oxygen and go back into the fib. So always shock, two minutes of CPR, prime the pump, and then do a pulse check. So now these four pad positions are acceptable. The anterior lateral, anterior posterior, and now we have the infrascapular and left and right. And, and all this is based on the size of the patient, but also any structures that, artificial structures that may be in the patient, like pacemakers, internal defibrillators, left ventricular assist devices, all that stuff. Um, once you as a medic intubate your patient, and we don't have to worry about the 30 to 2. This is another advantage to intubation. Intubation allows for asynchronous CPR. And 
that's the best way to maintain pressures in the cardiovascular system, is to not stop CPR. Asynchronous CPR is, is compressions with ventilations at the same time. The ventilation should be once every six to eight seconds. And what I like to say when I'm running a cardiac arrest, when the EMTs who I've now given the responsibility of handling an intubated patient, I tell them ventilate once every 10 compressions. You do the math and it kind of works out that it goes to six to eight seconds. So our compression ventilation ratio for a non-intubated patient, adults is 30 compressions to two ventilations and children is now 30 to two, one rescuer and 15 to two, two rescuer. That's children and infants. So that's one less thing you gotta remember. So adults, one or two rescuer, 30 to two. Children and infants, one rescuer is 30 to two and two rescuer is 15 to two. Those are the new guidelines. We kind of threw out cricoid pressure now. Um, it's, it's something that you can use for intubation purposes to assist in your intubation. It changes Lahane scores by one to two points sometimes and makes for better intubation success rates. That's fine, but as far as BLS is concerned, we've kind of thrown that off. Hands on CPR for lay rescuer, that's the compression only we talked about. And quickly activating EMS is part of community-based CPR. So as a paramedic, you know, it, it would behoove you and I would suggest you become a CPR instructor and teach this to the community. It's only going to make for better overall patient outcomes. You are an expert in the field with this and you should be able to know this at an instructor level where it's easily taught to others. Because we focus on the team approach. You are the leader of the team. You make patient care decisions. You decide when to stop CPR. You keep a record of what medications were given. You follow your protocols. But you also oversee the non-invasive procedures like chest compressions and ventilation. Well, we have new devices out here to assist you in this, in this leadership role. We have, we call the um, impedance threshold devices, like the rescue pod, which, which is in and out of favor. It's, it's regional. So once again, this, what this does is it's, um, it, it can actually limit the air entering the lungs between chest compressions, and that increases chest pressures in the thorax, which, which can aid in overall increased circulation. We have our mechanical devices, and the one advantage of a mechanical device is it gives consistent pressures. One thing about chest compressions is that it's inconsistent. It's only as good as the person doing it, and only as good as the person doing it effectively. And we lose efficacy every compression. It gets worse and worse and worse because you're getting tired. It expends a lot of energy. But if you have something like a piston device, you know, it's going to give us a consistent and constant uh, pulse you know, without having to pause to rest. We also have these load distributing bands, these CPR vests that actually um, squeeze down of the chest and change pressures that way. And what that does is it, it reduces the risk of sternal uh, fractures and the um, rib fractures that, you, that can occur with chest compressions. We also have landmark devices and things to improve, like little triggers for people who are doing CPR, to trigger them to let them know that they're doing CPR effectively because it's hard to gauge yourself when you're on the chest doing adequate compression. So having these types of CPR pro, um, performance devices is good for you because you can eyeball it and talk to the person doing compressions either, you know, watch what they're doing or change. And really part of the team approach is no more than two minutes on the chest. If you have enough people to do it, you should have one person waiting for to do compressions and the other person doing the compressions. So two minutes, jump off. The other person does it for two minutes. This is all part of your approach, and you're the leader of cardiac arrest management. All right, so we talked about shock, we talked about BLS resuscitation. Now let's talk about some body systems. And we're going to start with your neurologic system, and we're going to talk about different things that can happen to it. So the most common cause of brain disorders include non-traumatic brain injuries like stroke and TIAs, 
and also congenital issues like seizures, and then your minor things, headache, but then we have our all-encompassing altered mental status. And altered mental status can mean a whole myriad of things. We have to figure it out. And we do that based on environmental clues, patient interview, family interview, medical history, all those things make a determination on why they have a change in their mental status. So what is the brain? Of course, it runs the body. The body exists to keep the brain alive. We're bipeds because we have to go off and find food to give to cells, including our brain cells. The brain controls that. So the body exists to keep the brain alive. The brain controls all body functions. In addition to the autonomic functions of breathing, blood pressure, pulse, all that, uh, we also have conscious movement, the musculoskeletal system, the nervous system, the, the, I'm sorry, the somatic nervous system. So three major parts, we have the brain stem, the cerebellum, and the cerebrum. So the cerebrum is the, the database. It's where the intelligence comes from. It's where, you know, um, religions say the soul resides in the cerebrum. It's, it comprises you, your personality, your ability to learn, your desire for certain things come from the cerebrum. Okay, so that's under conscious, that's your, that's your area of consciousness. And then below that, the, there's a membrane known as the tentorium. So uh, below the tentorial membrane is your subconscious. So the subconscious is the cerebellum and the spinal cord, and that's your diagnostic center. Right? Make sure that your body is functioning in a, in a normal and balanced way. So that brain stem is, that subconscious part is controlling your breathing, your blood pressure, your ability to swallow effectively, pupillary constriction that responds to environmental changes or stress. The cerebellum controls your ability to walk and balance and uh, be able to, to uh, really showcase any talents that you might have as far as physical attributes come from your cerebellum. The cerebrum, this has different hemispheres. You have your right and left. And each one controls the opposite side of the body. The front of the cerebrum controls your emotion and thought, impulse control. The middle controls touch and movement, and the back processes sight. That's where the, the uh, optic nerve, which enervates to the center of the brain, comes to an end, in the visual cortex. So your brain is encased in your skull. It's it has no direct um, contact with anything. You are, you are who you are because what you sense of your outside environment. You need to have these senses and the, the nerves of sensation that, that allow you to process the outside world through sight, sound, taste, smell. These are known as your your 12 cranial nerves. The 12 cranial nerves are the first part of your peripheral nervous system. It's the first, the first nerves that innervate from the central nervous system when you're born. But off of your spinal cord is your other remaining peripheral nervous system and they carry signals out to the body through the somatic nervous system and through the autonomic involuntary nervous system. And this is where we see the spinal cord goes all the way down your spinal column, exits around L3, um, and becomes a network of nerves you can see at the base by the lower back, known as the cauda equina means horse's tail, and it goes down to your your um, legs and processes down there. So it's all, it also is part of your digestion and your your um, reproductive organs. So your brain, through this network of the central nervous system and peripheral nervous system, can not only recognize everything existing around it, but be able to control every single component in your body, either voluntarily or involuntarily. 
Now, a disorder of the brain is serious. The brain is very sensitive to, to um, decreases in oxygen, glucose, and temperature. Its focus is to stay alive. And the way that you can tell the brain is, is having a sensitive reaction is the patient will begin to have a change in their behavior, their mood, and in some cases, their ability to communicate. So the general rule we talk about with neurologic issues, because of the sensitivity uh, to low levels of oxygen, if there's a problem with the heart and lungs, the entire brain is going to be affected, and there's going to be an initial response. That's a change in normal behavior. If the problem is in the brain, possibly only one part of the brain is affected. Well, headache is one of the most common complaints that you have, and it can be, the, the problem with headaches is that they're nefarious. They can be very, a minor cause, like a muscular, a muscular um, tension headache. And it can be as bad as a brain tumor or a non-traumatic brain injury, a ruptured aneurysm. So, as paramedics, we need to see some of the subtle signs and symptoms, the differences between just a minor headache and a brain bleed. These tension headaches are the most common. The, the, the problem is that because they're the most common, we come in contact with them all the time, we kind of make the assumption that it's the only problem, that that's the, what we're going to be dealing with. And a good paramedic will look at somebody with a headache and rule out other more serious issues before settling down to a stress headache. Migraine headaches are second most common. Now, migraine headaches are internal type as opposed to a stress headache. This is um, caused by blood vessel changes. Now this can be serious because it can lead to an increase in cerebral perfusion pressure. But most migraines uh, resolve on their own without any, any damage. Sinus headaches, pressure on the sinus cavity, pushing against the frontal lobe, and that can cause problems with, with um, it can actually change your mood, and you can end up becoming very angry with a sinus headache. It's, it's different than a tension headache. Patients who you need to be concerned about are the ones who of sudden onset, very, very severe headache, like the worst headache of their life. This is a mild thing now. Can you have a tension headache that's the worst headache of your life? Absolutely. Okay, but these are, there is something wrong. You have to take into account that they called you for a reason. Now, I know people abusing EMS, so I'm not going to get into that. I understand that. I've been in the business long enough to realize that abuse does exist in the system. But... One thing you have to realize is that if somebody's calling you for a headache, that's not normal. So we have to first think, if it's serious enough for you to get called, then subconsciously the patient knows there's a problem. We've got to do a thorough assessment. we got to rule out a lot of things before we say, well, it just sounds like it's a tension headache. And that's an important thing. Don't make that jump to think that everybody calls you for nonsense. People call for different reasons, that's true, but you have to give them the benefit of the doubt because there's a reason why they're giving you a call. So think about doing that thorough patient assessment, even for something as minor as a headache. Find out when it started. Is it the type of thing that's really bad, maximal, at onset? Have you taken anything to help it? Have you had this problem before? All of these issues, your general approach to patient care should be the same for that trauma patient as it is for an MI, as it is for a headache. Now, strokes are known as cerebrovascular accidents, and it's also known as a non-traumatic brain injury. Whatever it's called, basically what, it, what happens is blood flow is interrupted to the brain. And now, as a result of this, brain tissue is starting to go into anaerobic metabolism and die. Once the brain cells die, that's it. Like muscle cells, you can't restore them. 
Ischemic stroke is the most common form of stroke. It's an obstructive type of stroke where the structures are intact. There's no breach. The, it's caused by a clot, uh, either a moving clot, an embolus, or a large formed clot known as a thrombus. Most commonly caused by atherosclerosis. There's other causes. So just to talk about atherosclerosis, what is it? It's formation of plaque on the walls of the vessel. Some of these vessels inside the brain are under lower pressure than the rest of the body. So in that area, they'll start to build up plaque. It'll form. And this plaque can, can actually um, pinch off blood supply and blood flow. Now, the other remaining percentage of strokes are hemorrhagic in nature. And this is a rupture of the vessel. You can have either the intracerebral inside the brain or a subarachnoid. Remember where, where the arachnoid membrane is located, in the meninges. The outer lining is known as the dura mater, the innermost lining, that connective tissue that separates, it, that connects to the brain is known as the pia mater. And then we have our arachnoid membrane, which is, it looks like a spider web of connective tissue, and, and that's where the Greek spider arachnoid comes from. So this is filled with cerebral spinal fluid and that allows for a good shock absorption. The subarachnoid space just above the pia mater has, um, is highly vascular. It has a network of veins and arteries that perfuse the arachnoid space and, and also deal with cerebral spinal fluid tension. So it's highly vascular and if it ruptures, you will end up with a subarachnoid Of the two, um, an intracerebral hemorrhage can cause more damage by blood going seeping through the brain. A subarachnoid bleed can cause pressure on the brain. Either way, it's a serious injury that's going to need surgical intervention. People at risk have histories of high blood pressure, which can put strain on these delicate arteries, this network of arteries inside the brain, they don't, they don't respond well to high pressure and they can rupture easily. Now intracerebral hemorrhages are often fatal because there's no way to stop the blood loss, whereas an aneurysm that's subarachnoid or, or epidural above the dura mater can be, the blood can be evacuated and reduce cerebral swelling that way. So the subarachnoid hemorrhage is going to occur when an aneurysm is overstretched and ruptured, and surgical repair can, can be done to correct it and hopefully reduce any brain uh, tissue loss due to the pressure caused by the buildup of blood in the arachnoid space. Now, transient ischemic attacks, these are mild strokes that only last less than 24 hours, and it's caused primarily by an embolus that it gets trapped and then it sometimes it'll move and then have full restoration. We can actually cure TIAs by administering oxygen because oxygen is a vasodilator and patients who have had a TIA you give oxygen to sometimes feel a lot better. They look like they're having a stroke, you start your assessment, you're giving them oxygen early and then they suddenly resolve. That's a TIA. But understand that every TIA is an emergency and just because they resolve and they're feeling better this could mean that the embolus could get stuck somewhere else or it could be a precursor to a much larger thrombotic stroke in the future. So these patients need to be evaluated at the hospital and they need some uh, medication and possible surgical intervention. So when we have our patients who are having a stroke, of course our general approach, scene safety, walk up, you have your body substance isolation, your gloves are on, everything, you make a general impression. Get vital signs. Find out the level of consciousness and pulse oximetry is always good. And for stroke management we do our um, neurologic assessment. If you're east of the Mississippi, it's known as the Cincinnati Prehospital Stroke Scale. If you're west of the Mississippi, it's known as the Los Angeles Prehospital Stroke Screening. Whatever you use, it all basically focuses on the same thing. Okay, you're looking for the ability for the patient to have um, somatic nervous system and involuntary functions working fine. 
subdural epidural bleeding can occur from a non-traumatic source or a traumatic source. But really primarily, these types of bleeds are secondary to a trauma. It could be something as serious as um, getting into a fight at a bar, getting hit over the head with a pool cue, to an elderly patient who fell out of bed and is now six hours later unresponsive. So the onset differs and you got to get the full story of what happened. But the difference is where it's occurring either inside the brain or above the meninges. Subdural is inside the brain below the dura mater. Epidural is outside the brain above the dura mater. But either way, we're causing pressure on the brain. And one problem with this structure that we have, the brain is protected inside the skull, but it's protected a little bit too well because there's no escape valves for pressure. So any buildup of pressure caused by swelling of the brain or excess blood uh, pooling like we have with, with uh, epidural or subdural hematoma, the brain's got nowhere to go to relieve the pressure, so the pressure forces the brain down into the, into the functional area, the subconscious area of the body, the cerebellum and the midbrain. And what we're going to end up with are dysfunctions on normal body processes. So for cere the cerebellum, they're going to have unsteady gait, inability to walk, sometimes paralysis. For the midbrain, they're going to have respiratory issues, inability to maintain an airway, central neurogenic hyperventilation syndrome, biots breathing. We've all heard this before, but it's all caused by that pressure being exerted downward upon it. So when we're doing this sign of symptoms of stroke, when we're either the Cincinnati or the Los Angeles, what do we want to look for? Well, the first thing we want to do is look for that facial droop. Facial droop tells you that you've lost tonicity because there's one part of the brain that is damaged. It's losing the ability to maintain, and the face will actually begin to droop. Those, those skeletal muscles will actually relax. You'll also develop sudden weakness and numbness on one side of the body. Loss of movement and sensation, lack of muscle coordination. This is all, like they said earlier, a respiratory system, system issue, a cardiovascular issue, will cause a systemic neuro, neuro, neurologic issue. But a, a neurologic injury will be an isolated one. So you can see it's isolated to one hemisphere of the brain. Patients can develop sudden vision loss, difficulty swallowing, decreased or increased level of responsiveness, speech issues, aphasia, dysphagia, inability to understand and process conversations, decreased absent movement in one extremity, a sudden worst headache of their life, confusion, dizziness, weakness, and they might not, they might have all of these, they might have one or two mild signs. It's our job to make that determination and to draw out that information. When we focus on um, responsiveness and cognition, not with the ANO times three or ANO times four, but we talk about Glasgow Coma Score. You want to talk about, you want to be a, a, a medical professional, we talk in GCS scores in medicine. And normally you get a 15, a chair can get a three, okay? So anything, if a dead body can get a three, just by, by being there, you know, it's hard to make this decision to add, add, add. You gotta understand how it works. I like to subtract down. So I give everybody the benefit of the doubt. Everybody starts with a 15, and I interview them. Are their eyes open? Yes? Okay, we haven't moved from 15, we're good. Now, best verbal response. They're oriented, but their speech is a little slurred. That's fine. They're still getting five points for that. They're still at a 15. But now, they don't respond with any motor response. 
none. They're talking to me and I, I, I try and tell them like, can you point to where there's pain and they say I can't move. Their GCS, they just lost five points. You understand? So we go from a 15 to a 10. You gotta lower people, give everybody the benefit of the doubt. Everybody starts at a 15, okay? And then you whittle it down. Remember, less than 13, we go to a specialty center. So, talking about stroke care, it's going to be difficult but critical to pinpoint when these symptoms first started. Most systems have a three hour window. The technology now exists to where it can extend. They're talking about it extending to six hours, but right now, it's three hours. And once again, review your stroke center guidelines, your local, regional, state, and national. We really deal with local guidelines when it comes to um, stroke times. And really, the national average is three hours. Getting someone to a stroke center from when the symptoms first started. So that's an important piece that needs to be brought to the hospital. Find out the Glasgow Coma Score, the results of the stroke assessment, and changes noted on reassessment. Now, left hemisphere involvement, that's where you have speech center involvement, primarily. Um, and bad enough can cause paralysis on the right side. Now, the right hemisphere involvement, won't have a, a situation with aphasia where the patient is staring at you and can't talk. They'll have slurred speech. They'll be able to talk, but th what they'll say, they'll use complete words and sentences, but it'll come along across as slurred speech. But once again, it's very difficult. The really the only way you're going to determine where a stroke is located is with imaging. So where are we going to find that? At a hospital. So we have to think about getting this patient to the hospital. Now, people who have chronic hypertension have a high risk of rupture. Our care for any patient having a stroke, of course, is airway management. Like I said, the pressure being exerted down on the diagnostic center of the brain is going to have an effect on their ability to control their airway, to breathe effectively, uh, or to breathe at all. So we need to focus on airway management, good oxygenation, think about uh, their circulatory compromise issues. Protect paralyzed extremities. Put the patient in a comfortable position and then keep them informed of what's going on even if they can't respond to you. If they have that left hemisphere and they're just looking at you, they can still understand what you're saying. So talk to them in a calm manner and explain what's going on. Now stroke centers employ different types of treatments and one of the most common ones we have is thrombolytic therapy. And what that is, of course, is the liquid plumber of the cardiovascular system. It gets rid of all clots. But it must be given within three hours of signs. And it's only given for um, stroke that's obstructive. It's not given for hemorrhagic. So getting patient to the hospital, they're not going to be waiting at the door with TPA or streptokinase to administer. The patient has to go in and get a CT. So, stroke centers lose their stroke center classification if their CAT scan or imaging centers go down. So be aware of that during your everyday work. If you get notification that the local hospital has no CT, they're not going to be able to receive stroke patients. Con you know, consult with medical control to find out which is the more appropriate facility to take them. You may get authorization to go to a further facility because they have imaging and can assist. And so in order to have that extra time to do this work, you know, we got to reduce our time at the scene. So we got to think about that platinum 10 minutes of trauma and incorporate it into stroke management. All right, so that's an important thing with this type of stroke, this non-traumatic brain injury. Right? The ability for hospitals to actually correct it completely, which is amazing. Now, seizures are a, can be a congenital issue, it can be a chronic issue, but it can also be acute. We have to make that determination. It's Whatever it is, it's a temporary alteration in consciousness. And about 30% of EMS calls involve seizures or seizure-like activity. 
4 million people in the United States have epilepsy. This is just a little, um, little bits of data for you to, to digest. So a generalized seizure is that classic grand mal activity. And it's characterized by unconsciousness and generalized severe twitching. Um, and it, it's resulting from the brain sending out signals to the somatic nervous system that is chaotic and abnormal. And you see that's, that's that somatic response of the muscle tetany, the tonicity, and then the clonic activity. There are other seizures that we have as well. We have our partial seizures. There's no change in the patient's consciousness, but they can have some signs and symptoms of what would appear to be a stroke. You know, they have the numbness, weakness, dizziness. They might have some brief paralysis as well, but it resolves on its own. They have complex partial seizures where the patient is actually, they look intoxicated. They're walking around. They're not having a conversation. There's no cognition, but there's movement and there's looks like purposeful movement. They call those automatisms, where they lip smack, they eye blink, they can actually manipulate things without any knowledge of what they were doing. And there's no interaction with the, with the outside. So there's no stimulus. So if you're, you're talking to them, they're not able to respond to you. And this, sometimes we misinterpret this as being an intoxicated state. It's not. This is known as a complex partial seizure. So once again, they're not going to be the ones calling 911. Okay. Hopefully, there's somebody there who called who understands what medical history they have. So, you say if they've been, they took any drugs or anything, do they have any medical history? Yeah, they have seizure disorder. Really? Do they? Has this ever happened before? This is when you get the information out of them. You know, so our tonic clonic seizure. This is a very easy to diagnose, uh, readily seen even for the most inexperienced or um, just an innocent bystander can tell if someone's having a seizure. Clonic phases last between one and three minutes. It's brought on by a brief, it's, it's followed by, I'm sorry, it's, the precursor is that tonic phase. Our big thing with tonic-clonic seizures is that this contraction relaxation uh, is affecting breathing. The diaphragm isn't working appropriately. Postictal state can be from five to 30 minutes, and this is a gradual return to consciousness. This return to consciousness is known as the lucid interval, when they wake up and they are responding. Now, seizures that continue without a lucid interval, or clonic activity is lasting more than 30 minutes, is known as status epilepticus, and this is a true medical emergency that requires sedatives and transport to the hospital. Once you have that seizure, the body begins to relax and it reboots itself. And during that period, the postictal state, this is when the patient can be managed most appropriately. They can be manipulated, put onto a stretcher, given oxygen, and strapped down for transport. So you don't do anything while they're seizing really take advantage of that postictal state in five to ten minutes to allow yourself to get the patient en route to the hospital. Because when the patient starts coming out of a postictal state, they're going to become combative. So we have to be able to take advantage of this period of unconsciousness to do all of our medical care and assessment before they have that period of confused combative state. Now, if they continue to remain confused and combative, even with oxygen, oxygen clears up their head and they feel a lot better with it, which is why you need to give it as part of your initial postictal treatment. If they are continuing to be combative, you gotta think about hypoglycemia. So, you know, it would be much better to draw some dead of finger stick uh, glucometer reading while they're in that postictal state than anything else. If their blood sugar is normal and they're still combative, they could have an infection. Something triggered their seizure. It could be something as benign as they stopped taking their medication to something as serious as septicemia. So there's different types of, of seizures. We have our epileptic, we talked about that's congenital. Then we can have our structural. It can be a brain abscess or a tumor can bring on a seizure. Um, 
head injury, stroke in some instances. Then there's the metabolic, hypoxia. That's why oxygen is the first drug that we think about administering. And then with children, they get the, fe the febrile seizures that are um, in response to elevated temps. It's a way the body blows off excess heat in children. Just having a febrile seizures mean you have a hist you're gonna have a history of seizures. Um, I personally had a febrile seizure when I was two years old, never had a seizure again, but it explains a lot about the type of person I am, I guess. I, maybe I landed on my head or something. But anyway, um, your ability to recognize um, when a seizure is coming can be important, especially if you have a, an instance where there's a seizure with no loose interval. Understand that the diaphragm is not moving effectively, so these patients are going to be hyperoxygenated. That's why, once again, giving oxygen in a postictal state will allow the postictal state to um, be shorter in length, but also the patient will come out of it less confused and more able to assist in their own care. So look at other problems that brought on the seizure. History of is fine, but you can have somebody who's an epileptic who also had a head injury. Don't get tunnel vision just based on their history. Get the whole story, general approach, that universal algorithm. So record all pertinent information, interview family members, whoever called. You know, patients aren't going to call now on themselves when they're having a seizure. Patients feel that aura. They complain of that. They either see bright lights flashing or they, they smell something or taste something metallic. And they know if they're like driving a car to pull over, hopefully, and then they'll have the seizure. If they're, but if they're just walking down the street by themselves and they start having a seizure, we don't know what happened. But we can still get a story. We want to always protect the airway, monitor breathing and circulation. Okay, when they're seizing, make sure no one jumps on top of them. Okay? Once again, you're directing everybody, you're in charge. Oxygen, oxygen, oxygen. Okay, if you can possibly get it on them while they're seizing, that's fine, but don't disrupt any seizures to put on oxygen. It's better to let the seizure happen and then during the postictal state, jump on the patient and do all of your care. Now, altered mental status is this blanket umbrella type of diagnosis. All right, it, it's the most common neurologic emergency, and it comes from all different sources and different morphologies. And what's, it, what's difficult about that is that there's all different things that can cause altered mental status, and with a patient who's having altered mental status, they're not able to assist in their own care. So you don't know where it's coming from, you just know that it exists. So you really have to take in a lot more information from other sources other than the patient. And look at all the different causes of altered mental status. Okay, the, the top ones that we have, of course, hypoglycemia and hypoxemia. Now we can correct those two very easily. All right, now other things, intoxication, alcohol or drugs. Head injury, prior head injuries that now have, have morphed into brain bleeds, a brain infection, body temperature abnormalities. All different things can bring on altered mental status. Of course, the last one is psychotic state or psychiatric condition, but that's at the very end, after everything else has been ruled out, is someone just plain old crazy. So we got, you can't think of it right off the bat as your initial diagnosis. You have to look at everything else first. And assessing someone with a change in mental status, it's environmental locations that you're looking for clues. And the outside, it's hard to talk to the patient, talk to the family, people who call, bystanders. Look around for evidence that there was trauma that existed. Um, calculate your initial GC GCS score and get your blood glucose levels. Every altered mental status patient should get a blue blood glucose level, even if they are not a diabetic. It's possible this patient took a, a, a drug that is going to increase their insulin production. If you don't have diabetes and you take glucophage, you will go into hypoglycemia. So these things are serious, so we still want to make sure we check this. So there's, there's ways that we um, can 
remember in our head all different causes of altered mental status, and one of the mnemonics they use is TIPS. Is it trauma? Is it infection? Is it psychogenic? Is it seizures? Alcohol, electrolytes, insulin, opiates, uremia. All these different things can bring on altered mental status, and we run full gamuts and, and get histories. Do your diagnostic testing, get a history, find out exactly what's going on. All right, but really the care should be based on what evidence you've gathered at the scene and what you've heard from, from uh, witnesses, bystanders, family members. If necessary, spinal mobilization. If you suspect trauma, if there's a mechanism of injury or a high index of suspicion, you're gonna mobilize this patient. We're gonna monitor the airway. Airway and ventilatory support is very important correcting that hypoxia because even a metabolic issue, if there's a drug intoxication that causes the altered mental status, this can lead to airway compromise. So always make sure we have the airway secured and the patient is breathing effectively. Capnography and, um, and you know the antidote CO2s and pulse oximetry if you're able to get in on the patient and transport to the most appropriate facility. Now, altered mental status can be um, can have different levels. You can have a combative altered mental status patient. You can have an unconscious altered mental status patient. Which one can you do more diagnostic testing on? It varies, obviously. So you think about that. I personally like treating unconscious patients. They're great. They let you do everything for them. It's all implied consent. So I can do all my diagnostic testing. I can, I can poke them with needles. I can start IVs on them. I can test their pulse oximetry, their end tidal CO2s. I can even intubate them if I need to, if need be. I mean, I can control everything on an unconscious patient. So more of your diagnostic testing can be done on that than a combative patient. So it varies with your patients. And as a medic, you know this already and are able to make those adjustments on the fly. Pediatric altered mental status, they go AMS the same reason as adults do. More profoundly, hypoglycemia, number one. Number two, close second, is, hypo, um, is hypoxia. Hemorrhagic strokes, rarely are congenital. If, if they are, you'll have a full history about that. They can be brought on by trauma, however. Seizures unless they have a congenital issue or there's an acute setting. The most acute setting seizure there is, is a febrile seizure. High fever, spike to temperature of 106, boom, seizure activity. You show up, the seizure activity stopped, the child is in a postictal state. You know, they're crying or they're grunting and, and uh, the parents tell you that they were running a fever and you feel their head and they're not feverish, that's because the febrile seizure took care of the fever. So trust what the family said to you, why they called. And of course, treat the airway, breathing, and circulation. Make sure the airway's open, you're gonna give them oxygen, and you're gonna check for capillary refill. These patients still need to go to the hospital because we don't know if it's just because it's a fever or it could be a brain abscess or a tumor. We don't know that. Can't make assumptions just because it's a child. Now the elderly patients, you gotta make as many assumptions as possible. You have to make an assumption that they have a non-functioning neuro, neurologic system it's, that's um, got a bleed or something when they show even mild signs. They need more aggressive diagnostic testing at the hospital. So any elderly patient who's presenting with sudden onset of altered mental status, we can't rule out stroke. It's gotta be part of the reason why they're going to the hospital. Sudden onset, change of mental status. It could be something as mild as um, a urinary tract infection that has brought on this change of mental status, especially with, with patients who suffer from brain disorders like Alzheimer's disease, where they can't verbalize or understand what's going on. So instead of that, oh, it burns when I pee and, it, and I'm feverish and stuff, this UTI is interpreted a different way and the patient becomes aggressive, hostile. So the elderly are very difficult to manage when they have altered mental status, but it's, it's easier if you look at it like this. They all have strokes until proven otherwise. Think about this stroke or a TIA for an elderly patient who is involved in a, in a motor vehicle crash. 
YTIA, it could have resolved when you uh, before you got there. Now they're feeling okay. Find out, you know, do they remember the event? Loss of memory can be caused by a stroke or a TIA. Can the can elderly patients overdose on drugs, narcotics? Absolutely. You know, do they take more medications than anybody any other population group? So there's a possibility of drug toxicity, um, interaction of drugs, potentiation of drugs. So this is an issue that you have to always have at the forefront when you have an elderly patient who's seizing. You know, don't be surprised you have a patient who's got a subdural hematoma by, from falling out of bed. I mentioned earlier, you know, you have this elderly patient that collapsed, you know, and then the they family says that, you know, all day she's been very lethargic and it's gotten worse and now she's unresponsive. Find out, well, what happened this morning or yesterday? Did, did you find her on the floor? Like, oh yeah, she fell yesterday. But I don't think that's why she's lethargic. Okay, I happen to think that's exactly why she's lethargic. She had a traumatic brain injury from just falling from a standing position. You have to think about this as a paramedic. Of course, don't ever tell the family that you disagree with them and say, "All right, but we, you know what? Let's get her checked out. Maybe she's, you know, she might be having a stroke. Let's just find that out." Okay. And the last system we're going to talk about is the gastrointestinal and general urinary emergencies. So um, abdominal pain is a, another very common complaint that you find in emergency medicine. And as a paramedic, it's not your responsibility to determine which organ or system itself is um, in pain and then sending out that visceral type of pain or any compromise that you have. Just the fact that they have abdominal pain itself is a medical emergency. The, the hospitals are going to do the imaging that will determine and the blood work that can, that can make decisions on which system is, is damaged. You need to be able to recognize a life-threatening problem and act on it appropriately quickly. Okay, um, So your ability to do a good assessment and provide emotional support in the face of a patient who is having anxiety and in intense pain is a problem. So it's a challenge for you as a paramedic, and now a lot of this, the way we can resolve this a lot of times is to realize that there's very little we can do at the scene and to start the process of transport to the hospital. So just to review anatomy and physiology of the GI system, you, you have the uh, abdominal cavity includes the gastrointestinal system, it also harbors the genital and urinary system. And in women, it's the gen, I'm sorry, in men, it's the genitourinary, it's one system combined whereas women have a genital and urinary system. And these organs that are in there, they're solid and hollow. There's all different types, and they're packed close together. Solid organs are going to include your liver, your spleen, pancreas, kidneys, ovaries, and they all have different functions, whether it's digestion, reproduction. Okay, so these solid organ injuries, they're, they're, one thing they have in common is that they are highly vascular. There's a lot of blood going through them, especially your your liver and your spleen. So any damage to these organs are going to cause incredible internal bleeding. Hollow organs have, you know, we have the gallbladder, the stomach, small intestine, large, and the urinary bladder. These are more of um, collecting basins, but they contain components of digestion. In the case of the stomach, the gallbladder, and the small intestine, and even the large intestine products of digestion and digestive enzymes, acids, and alkalis that if breached and released into the abdominal cavity can cause severe infection and tissue damage. So here's your breakdown of hollow organs on the left, your solid organs on the right. The GI system is responsible for digestion, just like the respiratory system is responsible for getting oxygen into of the bloodstream. The GI system is primarily responsible for getting nutrients like glucose and proteins into circulation. 
you, you eat food, it goes down to the stomach and the digestive process begins. First, it's, the digestive process is a breakdown of um, complex food products into their simple, basic components that can be used for cellular um, energy production. So what we've got is the food that you, you chew, it's a double quarter pound or cheese, all right? So, or a McRib if it's made. So you eat the McRib and golly knows what's being digested, but what happens is the stomach acid attacks it first and the acid breaks down the components that it's able to and then it goes into the duodenum. The duodenum has the common bile duct that breaks down the, you know, the, the uh, base alkalides coming from the liver as bile and the digestive enzymes that are coming from the pancreas. They meet the common bile duct and they dump in. And so the combination of the acid, the alkalides, and the, the um, pancreatic enzymes convert this McRib into a substance that can be absorbed known as chyme, C-H-Y-M-E. So this chyme is now um, inserted into the small intestine and starts at, past the jejunum, goes into the small intestine and starts the journey. And the small intestine is lined with blood vessels that actually absorb products that are usable. And the chyme slowly gets absorbed and all its usable components are removed. And what's left is the unusable or excess and that's fecal matter that then goes into the large intestine is then created and large intestine uh, will add water or subtract water depending on the um, body's need for water and then it drops into the rectum and is then excreted as fecal matter. So that's what we're talking about, the duodenum this is where the digestive juices all meet at the common bile duct, and we're converting that McRib into chyme. Now, in addition to the pancreatic enzymes, the pancreas also creates glucagon in the alpha cells and insulin in the beta cells. So the most, the mixing up and the breakdown, the decomposition of what you ate primary place that this happens, because it's now bathed in all of its different digestive juices, is in the jejunum. The small intestine, the ileum, is where this chyme is now traveling through a process, um, and through this process we're actually absorbing products, and these products are being sent to the liver for end filtration and assuring that no toxins remain that got absorbed that can make it into the, to the bloodstream and then this um, cleansed and nutrient rich venous blood is then sent into the great vessels and then is sent out for pumping across to the rest of the body. So anything that's left over the colon large intestine handles and peristalsis moves this waste through the intestine. The water is actually absorbed from it or retains it. it depends, the, the large intestine regulates. If, if the large intestine notices that the um, fecal matter itself is infest, infected or there's toxic in some way, it will increase water to excrete it faster. This is where you get the diarrhea from, but one of the downsides to diarrhea production is loss of water. So once the thing's up, we have our filtration devices. The spleen, located in the abdomen, it has no digestive function, but it's part of the lymphatic system, as opposed to the liver, that is the end filtration center of the digestive system. So the spleen is is where the lymphatic tissue, the lymphatic um, ducts and the lymphatic system sends its fluid 
for processing. Now, the lymphatic system is kind of like the sewer system of the body. It's found, it's opening, its openings are found in the interstitium between cells in tissue. And all of the byproducts of cellular metabolism drain into it. Just like um, a sewer system has the drainage access points. And then the pipes lead back to the spleen, and the spleen actually filters out. Another thing the spleen actually does is it's a reservoir for blood. It produces red blood cells, as well as different antibodies. The general system, the male reproductive system includes the testicles and the epidemis, the vasa differentia, the seminal vesicles, prostate gland, and then the penis. And it's designed to inject sperm into the vaginal opening as part of the reproductive pathway. Female reproductive system, its structures are in place with the purpose of fertilization of an egg. Starts in the ovaries. The ovaries kick out an egg through that luteinizing phase cycle. That kicks out the egg into the fallopian tube. And this is the period where highest probability of pregnancy takes place. Because this is where fertilization of the egg should take place, right in the fallopian tube. Fertilized egg comes out and it plants on the uterine wall. Hormones like progesterone and estrogen are regulated to maintain that uterine wall to be thick with excess blood to make a nice cushion. If the body senses that there is in fact no fertilized egg coming out of the fallopian tube, then that excess blood sloughs off in a three to four day procedure known as the menstrual cycle. Also, this is on a 28-day lunar cycle, prepping for life to be produced. Now, the urinary system, vital component to life, it controls what products remain in the blood. It handles the disposal of waste of cellular metabolism, primarily excess urea, nitrogen, and creatinine. It also can monitor hydration levels and pH balance. So it is the, it is the controlling organ of the metabolic buffer system. That acid-base balance that's that has to be regulated between 7.35 and 7.45. In the shock hyperperfusion arena where we're kicking off excess lactic acid, this is how we get rid of it. If the kidneys shut down, we lose the ability to filter out our blood of these acidic and toxic byproducts of metabolism. Coming off of the kidneys, we have our ureters, which connect to the bladder. The bladder is located behind the pubic symphysis and it empties out the urine. When it fills large enough, it, it sends out a response to micturate. And you urinate between 1.5 and 2 liters of urine per day. So this is the breakdown. So you have your kidneys, which are retroperitoneal. They sit behind the peritoneal sac. They're not encased in the peritoneal sac. And they drain, they're perfused by the renal arteries. They filter out the blood, filter out all of our urea content, all our creatinine, excess sodium, excess water, and in the form of urine. That's then collected in the bladder and drained out. Now, it's a lot of different functions going on in this tight space. It's a collection of organs doing different functions, organ systems doing different functions that, that sometimes collaborate with each other but have independent roles. So an inflammation of the abdominal compartment can have different 
morphologies and have and show different signs and symptoms. And some can have a universal sign and symptom. One of the big things is that diffuse pain. The peritoneal sac, if inflamed, will have diffuse abdominal pain. Foreign matter gets trapped in there. It can cause this inflammation of the peritoneal sac, known as peritonitis. So acute abdominal pain or acute abdomen refers to the sudden onset of abdominal pain. Now, it can be brought on by a progressive process that is now too much to bear. Peritonitis, inflammation of the peritoneum. What ends up happening is this inflammation causes muscular contractions and you lose the ability for digestion to occur. Retained gases and feces cause that distension. And the way the stomach can get rid of it is to rid of that excess pressure is through vomiting. You're excreting the wrong way, but you're shut down distally, so you've got to vomit. So there's two types of nerves that supply the peritoneum. We've got our parietal peritoneum um, and our visceral peritoneum. So parietal is, a, is part of the somatic nervous system. It's that tactile portion of the somatic nervous system. So when you have somatic pain, it is pinpoint. Just like you're able to pinpoint, I want to move my index finger or my thumb on my right hand versus my left hand, you know exactly where that is, and you know where pain is. I have pain on my left thumb, not like, well, the pain in my left thumb refers up to my throat. No, that's the somatic pathway is a, is a intricate network that's defined and monitored by the body, and you can know exactly what type of pain you have. So the parietal peritoneum is an offshoot of this somatic nervous system. So people with real pain can feel, perceive it to a certain area. Now visceral, that's organ pain. That's part of the autonomic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system is more of a downtown track. It's all about sending out messages. So when it receives a message coming up, it does not, the brain doesn't know how to process it properly. So you can't pinpoint exactly which organ's in pain because that's not supposed to happen. So it sends out referred signals. That entire region is pain. So the fact that you have regional pain, that's how you know you have internal pain. So you can see how, you know, with Murphy's sign, when you have that gallbladder pain, it's going up the autonomic nervous system and your brain doesn't know how to figure it out. So it sends, at the synapse points, it refers the pain. That's why you have that pain in the shoulder for gallbladder attacks. Now what can cause acute abdominal pain? Well, one of the most common ones is an issue with your digestive um, processes, your fluids. The peptic ulcer, we have a buildup of acid that breaks down the, the protective mucosal lining, affecting the smooth muscle, and the connective tissue, causing a burning sensation. The way we do is we reduce the acidic content and um, diet control usually resolves on its own. The mucous membrane will, will reform and protect again. Cystitis or bladder infection is also very common. We refer to it as a urinary tract infection. It's brought on by a bacterial infection and patients will report having a sense of urgency or fre uh, frequency in urination. And if it goes up the ureters to the kidneys, it can cause some real issues. Renal calculi, of course, kidney stones. Some can, can grow due to a blockage. It's congenital. There's others that are caused by diet, all different things. But the bottom line is it's extremely painful. And that pain is somatic in nature. You know exactly where that pain is. Coleocystitis or gallstones. Now, the whatever excess bile is not used during digestion is stored in the in the gallbladder. Because the liver doesn't always produce bile as quickly as the pancreas produces um, enzymes and the stomach produces acid. Bile is a breakdown of different cells by the liver. It 
makes bile. So it doesn't have a ready supply, so it stores some extra in the gallbladder. When the gallbladder gets clogged or there's a high salt content, it creates stones. And that's coleocystitis. Pancreatitis is inflammation of the pancreas. And what's dangerous about pancreatitis is that the enzymes, I mean, by enzyme by definition is a substance that can break down a component and not change its, its shape. It can maintain its, its uh, consistency and cause an energy production that breaks down it, whatever it's attacking. And pancreatic enzymes don't attack certain objects. They attack everything they come in contact with. They break down everything. So if you get pancreatic enzymes out of the common bile duct and, um, and now in tissue, it's going to cause damage tissue and inflammation. And in serious cases, um, can cause sepsis and, and internal hemorrhaging. So that's a very dangerous substance you don't want outside the body or outside the structures, the common bile duct. Appendicitis, infection or inflammation of the appendix. At some time, I don't know, five, six, seven years ago, probably had a use for the appendix. I don't know, some scientists said we had tails back then. I mean, who knows? But we don't really have any use for an appendix, but it sometimes gets in the way. It's at, it's at the turning point, a cornering of the large intestine, and sometimes you can get fecal matter, get trapped in there. It'll cause inflammation. Um, the issue with this is these patients um, need to have that appendix removed. If it ruptures, then we spill bowel contents into our abdominal cavity, and that can lead to sepsis and death. GI hemorrhage, same thing. It, it's, a, it's a bleeding in GI tract. You know, these, ve these vessels, um, they're very vascular because they're drawing out nutrients. And people who have chronic issues like alcoholism, where alcohol is one of the few substances that acids, bases, and pancreatic enzymes can't really break down, and it's volatile, and it can cause rupture of the vasculature that's inside your GI system if used chronically, and that can lead to a GI bleed. In addition, we have the esophagitis. Chronic alcoholism can cause this, of wearing down the lining. Once again, alcohol is hard to break down, and it's very caustic. So. Patients who have esophagitis, there's pain on swallowing, heartburn, some nausea, vomiting, and they'll have sores in their mouth from acid buildup. Esophageal varicy is a rupture of one of those vessels. And arterial varicy can cause death within minutes. So it's a really serious emergency, needs surgical intervention. A Mallory Weiss syndrome, a Mallory Weiss tear. The Mallory Weiss, is, it's a junction between the stomach and the esophagus. It's a little flap that closes down and prevents reflux. People who, who vomit excessively can tear this away and it will cause bleeding. Gastroenteritis is an inflammation of the GI tract and usually this is brought on by toxic food intake or um, food that's infected with bacteria. And the way the body kind of deals with this is it, it wants to readily flush it out so the large intestine will, will uh, add water to the stool making diarrhea. The lining of the stomach inside the small intestine, as peristalsis is occurring and food is, you know, the, the chyme is moving past uh, down the, the GI tract, the, they have little fingers that stick out. They look like little fingers. They're called diverticuli, and that's where they're lined with, that, with um, veins and arteries, and they help draw in that, the, the required nutrients, so assist in digestion. And you know, because they're little fingers, there's space between the fingers, and sometimes we have things that get trapped in between, and that begins to inflame them, and that's known as diverticulitis. Now, when you go down to the colon, the colon and the rectum is very vascular, and sometimes it's an entry point for medications, right? It's a route, like um, a rectal administration or medication. So it's very vascular, and through excessive straining or issues, um, also alcoholism can break down the lining and cause hemorrhoids to occur. Usually these are uh, minor and don't have systemic issues unless they become inflamed and sepsis can occur. But this is mostly managed at home, but in some serious cases need surgical intervention. Now, at, you have a great vessels going through your abdominal cavity, um, heading down to your lower reaches in your renal area. You have your abdominal aorta. Now, 
the abdominal aorta is under intense pressure. In some instances, that incre increasing pressure or congenital problems can cause a break in the tissue lining, and we end up with an aneurysm where we have blood that is now collecting in a, what we'll call a third space in between the tunica adventitia, the outermost lining, and the tunica media or tunica intima. So it's it's building up blood flow, building up blood collecting, and sometimes it'll dissect, create a false lumen, and we'll have collateral blood flow in there. Um, if you, if that's an aneurysm now, if an aneurysm bursts, then we end up with death within minutes. So we want to reduce that. So recognition of aneurysms, we talk about that in car, during cardiology, recognition of abdominal aneurysms are very uh, important as part of our pre-hospital care regimen. And usually you know that an aneurysm has just happened when, when the patient feels maximal, pain maximal at onset and it starts getting gradually better as it dissects down and creates that false lumen, it's creating less pressure and also less pain. So we got to watch for signs of shock with patients. That pulse tile mass thing, that's rare. So don't make a decision that it's not an aneurysm just because you don't feel pulse tile mass. Now, believe it or not, pneumonia, inflammation of the lungs, can, can cause abdominal pain. All right? In the lower parts of the lungs, it can, it can trigger gastritis, increased gastric uh, acid production, and that can lead to abdominal pain. Hernia is a protrusion through the muscle lining of an organ or tissue. And sometimes it's noticeable mass, sometimes it's not. Um, it's either reducible or it's incarcerated. So uh, it's either, either way, it needs to be surgically repaired. Intestinal obstructions, we, now we're talking about issues where, with peristalsis and digestion. And, and uh, when you have a bowel obstruction, you end up with a back, back up of pressure, gastric distension, vomiting, and you want, if you have a perforated intestine, now we're thinking about sepsis, septicemia. Moving down the lower quadrant, now we have our, our GYN issues. Um, women of childbearing age, and I, I like to say that a woman who is possibly able to be sexually active between 12 and 50, with sudden onset of abdominal pain, you have to think GYN. The most serious would be an ectopic pregnancy. Okay, but there are other things that can happen, but you want to think about ectopic pregnancy and ask the questions, however difficult they might be, to respect their privacy to find out if they are sexually active, there's any chance they might be pregnant. Certain renal disorders we have, we have benign prostatic hypertrophy. This is when the prostate becomes enlarged and it restricts urine flow. These Patients have frequent urination issues, um, incontinence at times, and they will have abdominal pain associated with that swelling and that urge to urinate. Acute kidney failure is different things that can cause acute kidney failure. We have pre-renal acute renal failure, renal acute renal failure, and post-renal. So acute renal failure would be caused from hypoperfusion, reduction of blood flow that then causes the kidneys to shut down. Renal failure, most commonly caused by toxic overwhelming or renal calculi, a stone that's developed in there, shutting the kidney down. And then post-renal renal failure can be from a stone that's blocking um, urine production, it backflows urine, that ruptures nephrons, or an infection that's traveled up the ureters from the urine from the bladder that has now inflamed the kidney and shut it down. Um, Prompt diagnosis of what's going on, treatment, we talk about in the shock arena, fluids to restore um, fluid, uh, restore blood flow, and in some in surgical intervention for kidney stones, and antibiotics for urinary tract infections can stop acute renal failure from, from becoming chronic renal failure. And of course, as you know, chronic renal failure is a um, permanent disease that requires artificial cleansing of the blood known as dialysis. And kidney dialysis is really the only definitive treatment for chronic renal failure. And it needs to be done sometimes up to five days a week to make sure that we filter out the blood and we restore hydration levels to normal. And there's different, there's the hemodialysis that's done 
at the machine level, and then we have the peritoneal dialysis where diacetyl is injected into the abdominal compartment and it draws in the, the uh, waste products and then that's drained out. And that's otherwise known as home dialysis. Adverse reactions to kidney dialysis include that sudden drop in pressure because the, the machine it looks and, and actually is a high-tech device, but it's not as high-tech as the kidney. It's not able to measure hydration levels as intricately as a kidney can do. In addition to that, you have muscle cramps from electrolyte imbalance, noise and vomiting can occur, hemorrhage from the site where, the, where we actually, the shunt where we inject the needle to draw the blood out and insert it back in, and this can also become infected. Abdominal pain on children, you know, it, it's very difficult to make a determination on exactly what's going on. So, um, one thing about children that's good is that they'll, while they'll lie about everything, they'll tell you the truth about their medical state. They'll tell you when they have pain. They won't make up stories, usually. You know, they won't say, like, an adult, you can give yourself a stroke by reading about strokes, okay? But children, they have abdominal pain, they'll tell you they have pain, it hurts right here. Bottom line with this, because there's so many different systems going on, and you're not sure exactly which one to pinpoint on, the only way you're going to find out is with imaging and blood work, and that's done at the hospital. Elderly patients, they don't experience that same somatic or even visceral pain like young people do. They may not have that guarding, that rigidity, but it still can be there. And number one cause of acute abdominal issues with elderly patients is bowel obstruction because they lose their peristalsis abilities. So our assessment for these GI complaints, of course, it's the universal algorithm. We size up the scene. We determine the mechanism of injury and the nature of illness. Right? Is it a trauma that we're going to? Is it somebody who's homesick? Are there any life threats? What's their level of consciousness? Is there airway compromise? Is there breathing issues? You know, we want to do pulse oximetry. We want to check circulatory status right off the bat. And don't get distracted by the abdominal pain if you don't feel a radial pulse and the patient's talking to you, put them on the monitor. They could be in a run of VTAC. All these different things you want to be looking at as part of your universal algorithm. Get a good history. Um, investigate their chief complaint. Are they vomiting? Is there a um, change in their bowel habits or urination? Are, are, did they move their bowels in the last two, three days? Is there belching? Any other pain? Things like that. What's their, are they taking in any food? And positioning patient. A patient with appendicitis draws up on the right knee and they have rebound pain. So when you palpate that area, the lower right, right quadrant, they don't feel pain on palpation. They feel incredible pain when you release. So normal abdomen is soft and non-tender. So signs of any pain or tenderness in any quadrant is an acute abdomen. So when you're doing this, you don't want to shock the patient and surprise them into it. You're going to explain you're going to palpate. If they don't want you to, that's fine. Then you can say it's diffuse, and they, that's a part of guarding. And if you touch them and they don't want you to touch them, then that can be determined, deemed as battery. So be very careful. Explain the procedure. And reassess constantly by just having them talk to you. Maintain, you know, get your vital signs once every five minutes for severe pain, or once every 15 minutes for non-severe, just diffuse pain. You really can't treat causes of, of acute abdomen. You treat for circulatory compromise issues, like GI bleed will have uh, signs and symptoms of compensatory shock, or maybe even decompensatory shock, so you want to treat for that. Um, make sure that you have a place for them to vomit, because the last thing you want to do is clean it up in the back of your ambulance after the job, so give them a place to vomit into. Um, you don't have to give them a high concentration oxygen. Nasal cannula is great. Even if you're suspecting someone who's, who's excessively vomiting, giving them a nasal cannula will reduce nausea. Um, and we have certain, depending on the region you're in, they have treatments like Zofram available IV for excessive vomiting that can get in the way of your assessment and can give the patient comfort at the same time. So, Wherever you go, whatever you do, make sure that you encounter the same universal algorithm. Um, and the most challenging patient you have is that altered mental status patient. Remember your, your issues for dealing with patients with shock. Know the difference, the different types of shock, the relative versus absolute hypovolemia, and 
and the role of fluid resuscitation in shock arena and know that you are the team leader in cardiac arrest management. Being able to um, do CPR at an instructor level is vital for um, your ability to work as a highly skilled paramedic. Thank you.